<clears throat> Good afternoon. Greetings to you all. I'm Pastor Rick here at New Life Christian Assembly in Haverhill, Mass. Uh, good to see you with us this afternoon for Tuesday Talk. As you can see, I'm alone today. Uh, Pamela is uh, involved with our grandchildren right now. And um, let's see. Um, I just got a text. Um, and I want to I want to share what's going on with, with that situation. Uh, but a couple of things happening here at the church. Why don't we open up with a word of prayer first, just a kind of a general prayer, and then we'll get into some sp a specific prayer request. And then I have a couple of scriptures I want to share with you today uh, regarding missions, since we're in the middle of missions month here at the church. All right, let's go to the Lord. Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we pray your blessing over Tuesday talk. Uh, we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to uh, just to minister to us in a special way. Uh, we invite him to come right now to touch our hearts and to direct our minds and to lead us in all that we pray about, all that we talk about, all that we read in your word, lead us to the cross. And uh, so, Lord, we just pray for this to be a good time in your, in your presence and a good time of fellowship with the body of Christ. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. All right. Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, our daughter, Stacy, who is our worship leader at the church, also our ladies leader, um, has Lyme disease. And most of our people know that. But um, it, she's had it for a number of years, a long time, over 10, more like 15, or even more than that. But anyway, it, 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 it's basically under control. However, Lyme disease is a very strange disease. Uh, it has affected her bones. And specifically, it has affected her, the bone in her jaw, which then has affected her teeth. So she had to go today for, uh, she went to the dentist, she had to go to oral surgery today. And they're doing some, some uh, bone graft, uh, bone, bone marrow grafting, I think you call it, to try to build up the, the support in her, in her jaw bone uh, to support her jaw and her teeth, etc. So that's where she is. So we were home with the her children today, while her husband Dan was at work. So I want to pray for Stacy to be well. We just heard that uh, they did what they had to do, and she's going to rest up before she comes home. Uh, so I want to pray for Stacy to be well. I uh, want to pray that she'll be able to lead worship on Sunday. We're not sure about that, but we'll, we'll play it by ear. Uh, then also, we heard another situation at the church. Our dear sister Danica Carter, James's wife, um, her grandfather had passed away yesterday, um, I believe he was living in West Virginia at the time. And so, you know, it's always a, a time of sorrow when, when someone close to you passes away. The good news is that he's a Christian, so he's with the Lord, uh, based on his confession of faith. So anyway, I want to pray for Danica and for her, her mom and dad and her family and so forth. I uh, want to continue to pray for our dear sister, Katie Lund. Um... Katie, uh, as you know, was in a car accident about two weeks ago. Uh, she was at Lawrence General. Uh, he, she transferred down to uh, Mass General at, down in Boston. Now she's in a rehab uh, center, I think, in Manchester, New Hampshire. So we'll, we'll probably be visiting with Katie this week. We want to pray for Katie to be well. And then uh, Joanna, uh, Joanne Feldman uh, continues to battle the side effects of collodial silver, that she took uh, some months ago. And um, we're so thankful we have a visitation team that has been going over there to pray with her every week. But um, I want to pray for Joanne and for her husband, Gary. Uh, okay, yes, James. Okay, so Danica's grandfather li lives in PA. All right, okay. And uh, Tony, I will certainly uh, pass that on to Pamela. She might be watching right now. Well, maybe she's not because she's tied up with the kids. You know, when the kids are really little, it's one thing. And now they're they're nine, ten, and eleven. It's a whole nother, uh, whole nother uh, <laughs> relationship, you know, as the kids um, get get older. But they are such a blessing. Remember, uh, some of you some of you may remember uh, this summer. I was sharing a story how uh, I was and Ella and I was with. <laughs> let me let me start again. We were at uh, Plum Island, and I was with Ava and Ella uh, at the beach down there. And we got into a little bit of a uh, trouble because uh, I miscalculated where we were 
from that little island out there off of Plum Island. There's a little island. And uh, we made it back to the shore, but it was I was huffing and puffing. I, I was really a little concerned. Anyway, I had a similar thing this, this morning. Uh, after, after Pam was helping with the homeschooling, uh, I said to the kids, let's go out and let's kick the ball around. So we're kicking this big beach ball type of thing. And uh, then they wanted to kind of rough house and play football. And boy, those three kids tackled me and they were, they were on top of me and I was fighting them off and I was trying to make it to the touchdown. And oh, but I had that same feeling like, oh, I can't breathe anymore. And I, I realized I'm not as young as I used to be, but, but it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. I, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything like the, the ocean, but it, was, it reminded me that I got to, you know, I just have to be careful, I guess, with my breathing. <laughs> anyway, so uh, can we pray for these four requests? Uh, Eva, thank you. She's in North, oh, Northeast in Salem. That's right. Yes. I, there was another person from our church that was there some time ago. I've been to that place. Very nice facility. So uh, we'll be getting up there hopefully this week. All right. Uh, so anyway, let me just, let me say hi to everyone real quickly. Uh, okay. Tony and Eva, I'm going to go from more recent to back. Tony, Eva, Gail. Thank you, Gail. James. All right. Uh, Joyce Ann Ellis. Oh, I think, is this Jerry's sister? I think it is. Or, or, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Jerry Ellis's sister. Okay. Uh, okay. That, that's about it. I see about uh, 10 people are on. So that's good. If you want to say hello. Oh, Lynn Harrison. Hello. Good to have you. And I just see uh, out, of my, out my window here, Stacy's coming in right now. So uh, she's going to be going over to our home, which is right across the driveway, uh, to kind of get the kids and get herself together. So um, let me, uh, I, I'm looking out the window. <laughs> well, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray for these, these four different prayer requests, okay? Father, Lord, I want to thank you right now that Stacy's home. I want to thank you, Lord, that... Uh, she got, made it through that surgery this morning, and thank you for the medical team working with her, Lord. We pray that her jaw is all right, her teeth are all right, and that the follow-up uh, procedures will go smoothly as well. But we pray against this Lyme disease, Lord. She's had such a time with her bones, with her eyes, uh, with her uh, di different things, muscles. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that this Lyme would be gone in the name of Jesus, and that she would be strengthened by your Holy Spirit to be able to fight it off and to be well. So Lord, touch her, let her heal quickly from today, and may your blessing continue to be upon her family. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for Danica <clears throat> and the passing of her grandfather yesterday. Lord, we just pray uh, for the family to sense your Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that he was a Christian. Uh, thank you that he's with you now. But Lord, it is certainly still sad for those that remain. We pray for Danica and her family, her, her siblings, her parents, other relatives, that are grieving. Let's just comfort them and strengthen them during these days. And uh, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for our sister Katie Lund. Uh, thank you that she's uh, progressed enough to go to a rehab uh, facility. We pray that she'll get the uh, physical therapy and rehab that she needs uh, to get back into tip-top health again, Lord. Just bless her time there. Let her, let her have the right therapist, the right workers, <clears throat> and let her time there be really well spent. Let her be well in every way. And uh, Lord, we, we pray for Joanne and uh, Gary Feldman, Lord, for continued healing for them in the name of Jesus. We pray for Joanne for the uh, side effects of the, of the colloidal silver that she ingested some time ago. Lord, the doctors say she can't, it can't get out of her system. But Lord, your word says that with you, all things are possible. So we pray, Lord, that somehow, some way, that, that silver will leave her body in the name of Jesus. We pray that she'll be able to eat, uh, get her nutrients, get her, get her weight back, and get on with her life. We pray, Lord, for Gary with his own health problems as well. Lord, heal him, strengthen him, and encourage him. And we thank you and we praise you for that as well. Lord, bless our time in your word now. We, we give you this time. Pray for your touch to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Uh, I want to... I want to go to Isaiah chapter 6, and I want to read a, a passage there, and there's a cross-reference in Revelation chapter 1. Um, so you may want to go to both places, Isaiah 6 and then Revelation chapter 1. 
And this is regarding the call to missions. This, this will be a great chapter, Isaiah 6, to preach from uh, during Missions Month, which I may do, as a matter of fact. Uh, not this Sunday, because one of our lay leaders, Bill Larios, will be bringing forth the word. But on the last Sunday, the 29th, uh, that's the Sunday we're taking our Faith Promise pledge cards for to set our budget for next year. But uh, I'm thinking about using this passage to, to create a message, a full-blown message. But you'll see what I mean in just a minute. So Isaiah chapter 6, uh, some of you may be familiar with it. And I want to go to Revelation chapter 1 as well. But Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So here, two things. I, I remember preaching on this subject before, but sometimes some, something has to die so we can really see the Lord. And in this case, King Uzziah died, and, uh, and then um, Isaiah had this vision. And, and uh, there's a point there that sometimes there's obstacles, there's things in the way that we can't see the Lord. But when King Uzziah died, the Lord revealed himself to Isaiah in such a way that Isaiah could see. And uh, the Lord was sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Um, that verse, by the way, has been uh, the subject of many songs over the years. But anyway, if you go over to Revelation chapter 1, we see another picture of the Lord. And I just want to bring a glimpse of what the Lord may look like or how he may appear. In Isaiah 6, the, the, he, he was wearing a robe, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So you get this idea that, that it's majestic, it's mighty, it's magnificent. It's, and there's probably a little analogy there that his robe filled the temple. I mean, literally, uh, I think that the idea is that his presence filled the temple. Uh, his, his, his glory filled the temple. But in Revelation chapter 1, uh, you know the story of John. When John was on the island of Patmos, uh, he was there uh, isolated, being punished for his witness of the Lord. But in verse number 10, Revelation 1.10, uh, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. So here we have something like uh, the Lord's voice sounds like a trumpet, like a like a blast, like a clear sound of a like a ooh, like just just the noise of His voice penetrating. And uh, the Lord says in verse eleven, "I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches." So this is John's initial revelation when the Lord spoke to him and said, "Okay, I'm going to give you a revelation. I want you to write these things down and send them to the seven churches." Um, we talk about these in Revelation 2 and 3. There's seven cities mentioned and different churches in those cities. But um, he lists them here in verse 11. Um, the seven churches of Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke to, with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Those are symbolic of the churches. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the waist with, with a golden band. So he has a, a, a glimpse of what Jesus looks like. His head and hair were white like wool. Um, his, uh, uh, I'm sorry. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. So here you have another sound, uh, trying to make an analogy of what his voice sounded like, a trumpet or many waters. If you think of uh, the waters rushing down a stream or over a waterfall, there's that roar of the many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives, who was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of, of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So that was John's introduction. And, and remember, John... You know, John uh, lived with Jesus for three years on the earth, so he was familiar with what Jesus looked like. But now we're seeing Jesus <clears throat> in his glorified state. Uh, so, 
it, it's a little bit different. I'm sure there was a resemblance, but he, he, he was just radiant. He was on fire. He was, he was just on fire. Uh, James, thank you. Uh, all right. Well, I have this little lamp that Stacy got, and here I am. There's different settings. I just took a, a guess at it, and I, I'm glad it's working. Well, at, back in Isaiah 6. So Isaiah sees the Lord, and verse number 2. Uh, uh, above it, above the, the temple where Jesus was. Uh, hello, Doreen. Good to have you. Oh, I want to pray for Billy before we get off here today. Um, but we're in Isaiah 6, 2. Uh, above the temple where, where Jesus, where Isaiah sees Jesus, there were, there were angels. There were seraphim, angels. Each one had six wings. With two, we covered his face. Two, we covered his feet. Two, we flew. And one, of, one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Whenever you see the, the word holy three times, it's like it's symbolic of really, 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 really holy. Like holy, holy, holy. It's like it's a way of, 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 of explaining how deep the holiness is. The whole earth is full of his glory. And uh, the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So Isaiah's having this vision, you know. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a really spiritual vision. He sees the Lord. He sees the angels. The place is shaking. There's smoke. And, you know, just the glory of God is in that place. And Isaiah is privy to this. And so Isaiah responds in verse number five. Woe is me, I am undone. And so we, we, we learn from that. Uh, we, we have this type of thing. Not to this degree, but similarly, we have a similar thing every now and then at church when the presence of God is so heavy upon the worship time or the prayer time and, and everything's disrupted. We forget about the agenda. We throw it out the window and, and God is just so real and we feel his presence so strongly. And like Isaiah, he says in verse five, woe is me, I am undone. We feel like, like woe is me, I, I'm in the presence of God, but I need to be cleansed by God. I'm not holy enough to be in it. I don't deserve to be in his presence. And Isaiah says, I'm undone, meaning I'm beside myself. I don't know what I, I, I I'm not, I'm not right. I appreciate God being here, but I, I don't feel like I'm good enough to, you know, to fit in here. And so he says, because I'm a man of unclean lips. So his words, you know, would be negative or, or worse, would be sinful. And uh, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I live with people that don't speak right, that, that our heart are ba is bad. And Jesus said, out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But he says, my, for my eyes have seen the king, I've seen the Lord of hosts, but my, my no, I know I'm not right. And my, the people I'm with are not right. So verse number six, we love this. There's a lot of analogy here. But one of the seraphim, one of the angels flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. So, so you get the idea that the angel got some of the fire from where the Lord was and brought it and brought it to Isaiah's mouth and touched him. He said, my lips are unclean. So he touched his lips to purify him. That is definitely uh, symbolic of the blood of Christ coming upon us and cleansing us from our sin. And, uh, and then he says, uh, the angel says in verse 7, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. So hallelujah. So the analogy would be when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, you know, that's the coal. That, that's, the, that's the essence of what's going on here, just in a different form. So then in verse number 8, Isaiah says, Okay, I, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Us meaning Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Who will go? Who will go? And and and, and who, who will I send? Because I've got I've got work for someone to do. Who will go? And so Isaiah is, this is all in a vision. And Isaiah says in verse number, the end of verse number eight, here I am, Lord, send me. And and we want to stop right there for a second. But um so so there's a picture here. When we get cleansed by the blood, when we're you know, another thing is you could think about the coal being a work of the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit. 
And so I, I kind of put both in there, actually. The blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. The fire of the Holy Spirit propels us to go forward, to do great things for the Lord. And so, um, so he, the, the Lord says, who will go? Uh, Isaiah says, I will go, send me. And th that's a great attitude. That is a, that's how the attitude should be. You know, we're cleansed. We're cleansed by the blood. We're empowered by the Spirit, Acts 1.8, you know. Uh, we, you shall receive power. So we're cleansed by the blood. We're empowered by the Spirit. I like that phrase. That would be a good sermon title too. Cleansed by the blood, empowered by the Spirit. Um, but most people stop at verse number 8, and I usually do too, but I want to read on to make a point. Because sometimes when we say yes to the Lord, you know, we don't always know where that will take us. We just want to be obedient. And uh, I'm learning as I go along here, and I've, I've been going along for a long time. In fact, I found a letter, uh, Pamela found a couple of letters uh, that were written to me um, from our previous uh, superintendents in our district. Uh, one was, I think, uh, congratulating me when I got ordained uh, around, two, I think, 2001. But I'd been licensed for, you know, for uh, eight years. But... You know, and I, you know, I've been a Christian a long time. But anyway, when we said yes to the Lord, many years, Pam, okay, Pamela and I said yes to the Lord when uh, we were attending a church in Greenwich, Connecticut in the 80s, and they had asked us if we would come on staff. So I had to leave my position as a business manager at the Greenwich, Connecticut Association for Retarded Citizens and leave that position and, and trust God for a salary and a package uh, to support my family. But I did, uh, gladly I did. And uh, after, after, what, uh, six or seven years there, we felt a call to go to Massachusetts, and we said, yes, we're going to do that. And after 14 years there, we felt a call to go from that city to where we are now. And we've been here coming up on uh, 13 completed years in December. And... Um, so, but, you know, I, we said yes. And if I, <laughs> you never know what, what the result of saying yes is going to be. The point is to say yes and to go and do it. You don't know what's going to happen. So the whole experience has got to be a faith walk. Let me break it down a little bit different. The Lord may be speaking to some of you about uh, what you're doing with your faith and what you're doing with your witness to your family. That's a, that's a huge responsibility uh, to your co-workers at your workplace. Um, if you're in school, uh, to fellow students or your teachers. Uh, I can remember after I got saved many years ago, going back to college and being a witness to some of my teachers. And they looked at me like I was crazy, but I felt like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here because God changed my life. But, you know, so, how, how, so God is asking you, who's going to... And another thing I always ask, I always comment on, <clears throat> when I feel the Lord saying to me, okay, like a family member, why do I have to be the one to, to bring Christ into the, equa into the equation? Why do I have to be the one that always prays over the food or whatever? And then like a second later, the Holy Spirit says, duh, you're the Christian guy, remember? Uh, who, else, who else is the Lord going to call? So you have to have that attitude like, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. He's going to call us to do something for his kingdom. And so you have to, when you say yes, you say yes, and you go, you go for it. But what I want to say is, uh, when you say yes, um, just get ready for the roller coaster. Because it's not probably not going to be a bed of roses. And it's probably going to have some hardship involved. But the fact that you said yes gives you, gives you the blessing that will enable you to continue with whatever it is. Let me just read these comments. James, saying yes to God is like putting on a blindfold to walk it by faith. Yeah, like Abraham, right? Just not knowing, uh, just knowing we're following God's voice. Absolutely, like Abraham. We didn't know where he was going. Uh, Danica, Janae, Carter and I living in Matt. James, James is a fellow New York stater. And uh, I know, James, you're, you, I know you are living by faith. And we really appreciate you being here. 
Um, and Doreen, thank you for your comment there. That's great. Appreciate that. So anyway, but here, here's the rest of the story. So Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 9. So uh, up, up until now, Isaiah is cleansed. He's empowered. He says yes. In verse number 9, the Lord said, Okay, go tell this people that you keep on hearing, but you don't get it. You don't understand. Keep on seeing, but you don't perceive. So go to this people, Israel, that, that don't, they hear, but they don't hear. They see, but they don't see. Verse number 10, uh, you're, you're, so what the Lord is saying in verse number 10, Isaiah, if you go and do this, your words are going to fall upon deaf ears. They're going to, uh, their heart will be, uh, the heart of the people is dull. Their eyes are heavy. Uh, they shut their eyes. They see, uh, they shut their eyes and they don't see with their eyes. Uh, and hear with their ears, they don't understand with their heart, uh, they, they would return and be healed, but they shut down. They shut down their eyes, they shut down their heart, they shut down their ears. In other words, they're not going to receive what you have to say, but I want you to go there to say it anyway. That's the clencher right there. So why would God have him do that, you know? Well, I'll tell you, there is an answer to that. But the majority of people will reject what Isaiah was going to say. And that makes me wonder, you know, yesterday I, I came across some old uh, DVDs that we had uh, in, in one of the rooms in the house and we're trying to clean up. And so I, I played some old DVDs that we had from our previous place of ministry. We had uh, videos from, you know, up here in Haverhill, we do, we do um, Hillstock. Down in, in Webster, we did Webstock. It was an outdoor festival type of thing. But we have video of uh, a uh, uh, DVDs of those, and um, all the people, oh my goodness, so many people, I wonder, wh where are they? I hope they're serving the Lord. You know, we baptized so many people at the lake there, and I just thought, well, you know, I don't know. All, all I know, I'm called to preach the Word of God, and whatever happens, happens. You know, and, and you know, whatever, whatever happens with the churches, like here in Haverhill, you know, we try our hardest to, to make our church good and, and, and right and preach the word and do things orderly and so forth. Um, and so whether we have, you know, 200 or 300 or 500 or 1,000 people or 50 people, it doesn't even matter, really. What matters is that we're doing what God asks us to do. So let me go on. So, so the Lord says, okay, you're going to go. They're not going to hear you, Isaiah. Their, ear, their ears are dull, their eyes are blurry, and, and their heart is cold. But I want you to go anyway. Then, so Isaiah says in verse number 11, how long? <laughs> Good question, Isaiah. Lord, how long do you want me to do this? If they're not going to listen to me, how long do you want me to do it? And he says, the Lord says in verse number 11, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men uh, far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it until nobody's left in the place. Verse number 12, I'm sorry, verse number 13, 13 but the Lord says, a tenth will be in it. Your preaching will win a tenth of those people. They will return and will be for a consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak tree whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. So here's the, here's the, uh, the silver lining. The multitudes will fly away. The multitudes will leave. The city will be ruined. It's going to be, it's going to be taken over. But there's going to be a remnant of people that hear the message. And that's what you have to focus on. Those people that hear the message and, uh, and we'll continue on with the things of the Lord. So I, I share that today uh, regarding our missions month. Uh, I shared on Sunday, we have a, a woman that's a Assembly of God missionary in Japan. And after probably 30 years, maybe even more than that, uh, she's been ministering there. The fruit of her ministry is very minimal, if I could just put it like that. Not a lot of people are responding. 30 years preaching, teaching, trying to be encouraged in the Lord, trying to build something for God. And Japan is a hard, hard place. 
it's, it's, it's technologically advanced. It's culturally advanced. It's, you know, it's not like living in poverty. It's not that. It's, it's, it's a different kind of difficulty. Uh, but she's so faithful. That, that's why the, when Jesus taught, told that parable about utilizing the talents or the, the resources God blesses you with, um, and he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Um, he's not looking for tremendous number. He's looking for faithfulness to use what you have. Uh, so anyway, uh, I want to encourage everyone listening today, um, if, you're, if you have some burden for a people, if you have a burden for people at work or people in your family or pe even people at church or people in your community, if you have a burden for some type of particular ministry at the church, uh, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. You know, I, I, I share often that I've been praying for things. Um, I've been praying for some things for a long time, and I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes I see a flicker, but what I see doesn't matter. I, I'm praying because, because I know God is able. And I also know from Matthew 6 that even though God knows what I need before I ask him, um, he wants to hear my voice. He wants to hear my heart. So I, I tell him my heart and I bear my soul to the Lord. So I want to encourage you to keep on going no matter what the results are that you may see. Let me read a few more comments. Okay, Doreen, thank you. Uh, the Lord helps me with my walk. Okay, have ears to hear. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. those people didn't have ears to hear or, or eyes to see. The Lord said, tell them anyway. Uh, God's word is often rejected by people out of a place of personal conviction. Yep, conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that would mean the Holy Spirit is at work in them despite their rejection. Yeah, like-minded people. Some plant the seed, God brings the growth. Yeah, others bear the fruit. Uh, she's planting the seeds. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's very true. All right. So, um, hope that was a little encouraging word for you today to to uh, seek the Lord. Um, again, putting it all together, King Uzziah died. Then the Isaiah saw this. Maybe some things in our life have to die before we see the Lord and and the burden the Lord has for us to carry. Um, but you know. When we're cleansed, when we're washed by the blood, we're empowered by the Spirit. Uh, he sets us out, and he wants to know, who will go? Who will do it? Well, I'll do it. Okay. Well, you, you have to do it regardless of what the results are, because sometimes the results aren't what we think they're going to be. But it's, it's obedience that is the issue. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you, James. Um, I think we have about 12 people on here today, so thank you for joining us on Tuesday Talk. Uh, Thursday talk, uh, I should be with my granddaughter Ella, uh, who continues to be quite the character and quite the uh, preacher, and uh, she's a blessing, uh, as are her brother and sister, Ava and Jack. Um, yeah, all right, thank you guys. All right, so let's say a little prayer, and then I'll let you go. Dear Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this little uh, devotional Lord, speak to our hearts. Let us, let, us see, uh, let us see our world that we live in, our, our little world that we live in, uh, as our mission field. And Lord, here I am, send me. You, you say, Lord, who will send? Who will go? Who will say something on my behalf? Lord, here we are, send us, oh God. And Lord, let us go with the anointing of your spirit, regardless of what the results are. Let us be a good witness for you. We thank you for these opportunities. And we do pray for good fruit. Lord, if we're planting seeds, great. If we're reaping some of the crop, great too. But uh, let us be part of the whole process of sowing and reaping souls for the kingdom of God. All right, Lord, we thank you for this. I pray your blessing, Lord, over everyone. Let us have a great week. And uh, Lord, let us have some great services this week on Wednesday night, the Bible study uh, online and the services on Sunday. Bless them and we give you thanks for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. There is a uh, women's meeting this Friday night in-house. So ladies, if you're local, feel free to join us at 7 o'clock at the church. All right, thank you all. I love you. I appreciate you being here. Um, I love this fellowship. I really do. I'm glad that you signed on. I wouldn't want to be here talking to myself. So I know that I'm not, and I appreciate that. All right, I'll let you go. God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye.